was the day after Christmas and the animals were stirring, the baby is sleeping, whom Mary's adoring. Though she's exhausted and sleepless, barely a wink through the night, the glory surrounds her at the dawn's early light. She's weak, she's sore, and barely can stand. The days have been trying for her and her man. Forced to look for some shelter, they found a room in a stable. No room in the inn, no guest rooms available. She was surrounded by animals, no meds for her pain. Have given birth to a miracle only the supernatural can explain. No bed, no privacy, just the straw on the ground in the midst of the animals, baby Jesus could be found. But what a night that turned out to be. The Virgin Mary had gone into neighbor, gone into labor the night before. And so many memories swirled around in her thoughts and you know, as did the scent of the animals with whom she shared their space. She had never experienced such pain. And she recalled how difficult it was to catch her breath between each contraction, gritting her teeth, grasping and clutching with each breath. And Joseph did everything that he could to help Mary get comfortable, placing a little padding between Mary and the cold, cold crown. It was late when the baby came. The silence of the night was broken by the whelp and the cries of the newborn baby Jesus. A climactic ending of physical exhaustion and pain. But oh, what a beautiful baby. The angels were rejoicing. The light of God displaced the darkness. There were tears of joy. Joseph beamed with excitement, just as if the baby Jesus was his very own son. Only Joseph and Mary knew who the real father was. The baby was placed upon Mary's chest to suckle, to be cuddled, to acclimate to his new surroundings. As tired as Mary was, she was too excited to sleep. Tears continued to roll down her cheeks as she bent down to gaze so lovingly upon her baby boy. Joseph knelt by her side and watched this miracle snuggle up to Mary for warmth. But there was no rest for Joseph and Mary that night. There came a knock. It was shepherds. From the fields they had come, from the outside of Bethlehem, they had come to see the Son of God that the angels had told them all about. Now normally, shepherds would not be welcomed into the city, especially at night, knocking on doorways. But these shepherds were invited to come by God's holy messengers, proclaiming his birth, giving glory to God that night. They had witnessed the miracle of an all-loving, all-caring God and his glory not only brightened the night sky, but gave hope to the shepherds and brightened their hearts as well. Those shepherds would never forget how the sky lit up as they camped around the smoldering embers of their fire. The night became ablaze with angels, an army of angels singing glory 
to God in the highest, peace and goodwill to men. A king was born, go and see him. A star glowed brightly over where they could find the Son of God, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And the angels told the shepherds to go and witness this miraculous event, and they went. They were overly excited, way too excited to stay in their camp that night. They would never be able to get any sleep after all they had witnessed and heard. It was late when they found the baby, just as the angels said they would. Bundled in a blanket, asleep in the hay, Mary had laid him on a cushion of straw in the middle of this concrete and stone manger. They fell to their knees. <coughs> Tears were pouring down their faces. It was just as the angels had said. Unlike the rest of Bethlehem, they were witnessing the newborn king of the Jews, the son of man, the son of God. Mary and Joseph cried with them as the shepherds shared how the first angel had brought them the good news of the birth of the newborn king. Mary and Joseph both realized that everything that the angel Gabriel had told them had come true. They were the parents of Emmanuel, the Son of God. He was with us, incarnate, true God from true God. He was their child. There was no lamenting among them. Every ache, all the discomfort, the lack of comfortable tidings, none of it mattered. The prophecies had all come true. They were a part of it. This tiny baby that Mary, the Virgin Mary, had carried in her womb for nine months, this miracle baby was the Son of God. It was the middle of the night when the shepherds finally left and returned back to their flocks. But Mary and Joseph could not sleep. The glory of God was everywhere that night. After giving birth, after the shepherds stopped by, after hearing all about the heavenly angels and their declarations about their little baby, the tiny little boy she was holding in her arms, Mary couldn't sleep. But finally, exhaustion got the best of her and Joseph, and they both fell asleep. only to be awakened in what seemed like minutes by the rustling of the animals around them. It was morning. The animals were restless. They awakened the household in order to go outside and begin a new day. It was the first day in the life of Jesus in the flesh. Jesus, the Son of God, who only hours before had left the glory of heaven. He began his life, his ministry, here on this earth. Jesus had come from where time was eternal to begin his first day as one of us. Now, years ago, <clears throat> I attended a wonderful Episcopal church, and it was because of that rector at that church, that pastor, that this prodigal son came back to the Lord. As part of our services in this liturgical Episcopal church, 
we would recite the Nicene Creed. It begins like this. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and he was made man. Jesus was begotten of the Father. Jesus was begotten, not made, not created. When you beget, you beget something of the same kind as yourself. C.L. Lewis explains it this way. A man begets human beings. A beaver begets little beavers. A bird begets eggs, and the eggs become little birds. I begot a son. His name is Ryan. He is human because I am human. What God begets is God. Jesus was begotten, and he became incarnate, meaning he was God in human flesh. Although Jesus was fully human, he was also fully God. Amen. What God begets is God. Jesus was begotten, not created. What God creates is not God, just as what man creates is not man. Humans may be like God because they are created in the image of God, but we're more like statues. C.L. Lewis says, Man has the likeness of God, but he does not have the kind of life that God has. We are made in the image of God but we are lacking the stuff that brings us to life. And that's what the Christmas story is all about. God is the clay maker. He is the sculptor. We are the statues. We are the shepherds. We are the wise men. We are the innkeepers. God puts our spirit inside of us and we come to life. It gives us life. And then it's up to us to choose what are we going to do with this life. Are we going to become like those shepherds? Are we going to hear of the glory of God, of the Lord, and come to him? Are we going to come and worship him? Are we going to call him our king? Or are we going to be more like the end kickers and have no room for Jesus in our life and not allow him to enter into our hearts? If we choose to let Jesus in, if we choose to let the spirit of Jesus in, our life will become more like his life. And that's a good thing. That's the blessing of God. The Christmas story is an ongoing story. It has no end until Jesus comes again. Sometimes God knocks at our door and we are asked if there is room for him. Can he come in? And there are those of us who look at how our lives would need to change if we were to make room for Jesus, and if we were to allow him into our hearts and into our life. And we don't like what we would have to give up. 
We won't like what we'd have to give up in order to allow Jesus into our life. Our world, our life would change. And we like living in the flesh. We like living in our sin. So we close the door and we say, there's no place for you here. But sometimes we need a change in our life. We need some hope. And even though we don't know Jesus very well, even though we don't have a relationship with him, and we're not even completely sure if Jesus is the answer, we might crack open our door just a little bit. And just let him in. Just a little bit. Just in case. Just in case what we read in our Bibles is true. Just in case what we heard about Jesus is true. Just in case Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God. And as poorly as we think about ourselves sometimes, does he really love us? Jesus stands at the door and he knocks. He just needs a little bit of an opening, just a tiny little crack to let the Holy Spirit in and plant a seed into our hearts. And let's see what will grow. The Christmas story teaches us about opening up ourselves to what God is trying to do in us and in our lives. It's about telling God that even though my faith isn't what it ought to be or what it should be, there is room for God in my life. And we want to be a part of what God is doing. So if you're here today, if you're watching online, if you're listening online, there's a good chance that you want God to be a part of your life. Some part of you wants to be rescued, wants to be changed, wants to be loved. You want to experience God's love from a God who would give up everything because he loves you and he wants to save you. And he wants to show you his love. Some part of you wants to be a part of the Christmas story. And the good news is that God is still writing the Christmas story. God is still writing the story of what happened when Christ came to this world. And the best news is that Christ is coming again Amen. for you if you're a part of the story. It's God's greatest desire that you be a part of the Christmas story. The greatest story ever told. So the question is, do you want to be the innkeeper that closed the door on Jesus? Or do you want to let God into your life and come to God, come to Jesus like the shepherds did? Scripture tells us that while they were out in the fields, the shepherds heard that a baby, a king, had been born. And they got up, and they came, and they saw the love of God lying there in a manger. That's who I want to be. I want to be a part the Christmas story. I don't want to close the doors to my heart. When God is about to do something new, I want to be there. I want to see it. I want to be a part of it. When I hear what God is doing, I'm going to come running. Whatever God is doing, I want to be a part of that story. And you can too. 
Now, right now, just tell God you want to be a part of the Christmas story. You choose Him. You open the door to your heart. You let Him in. You ask Him for forgiveness. You ask Him to forgive you because you are a sinner. You ask Him to come into your heart and to guide you and to lead you and to bless you and to be a part of your life. Now, when Jesus walked with us, he was asked, what does God really want from us more than anything else? And Jesus answered, to love your Lord, your God, with all of your heart and your neighbors as yourself. In other words, open the door of your heart and let the love of God in. So if Christmas is about the incarnation of God, if the Son of God, the incarnate Son of God said, love your God and love your neighbors, then the heart of the Christmas story is to love God, to love your neighbors. Christmas is about love. So this year, after the Christmas dinner has all been eaten, the tree has been put away, and you've packed up the nativity and all of the director decorations, you put them away in their boxes. The real measure of how well you celebrated your Christmas won't be what you open from under your tree. The real measure of Christmas is whether or not you opened up your heart and you let the Christmas message in. So Merry Christmas. May you have Christmas with you throughout the entire year. Amen. Amen. Amen.